Karen Sykes, I'm a judge on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago, and I will be your moderator this afternoon for this panel discussion on the topic of government attorneys and the global war on terror. After the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, lawyers in the White House, at the Justice Department and Defense Department, and in the intelligence community were called upon to give advice about the legal constraints on the government's response to the attacks, as well as to the ongoing threat of terrorism. That advice took the form of memoranda and discussions, and government officials at various levels formulated policies and otherwise acted on the basis of that advice. Over time, through the shift in military focus from Afghanistan to Iraq and back to Afghanistan, criticism mounted. Criticism of the Guantanamo detention facility, the interrogation of detainees, and the use of harsh interrogation tactics, surveillance issues, the use of military commissions to try certain detainees, and other anti-terrorism policies of the federal government. Eventually, the spotlight turned to the legal advice that government lawyers had given on these issues. Our panel this afternoon will explore some of the important and difficult questions that have arisen as a result of the criticism of the work of government lawyers in response to the 9-11 attacks. What, if anything, did these government lawyers do wrong? Did they violate any law or rule of professional responsibility, and if so, how? What are the legal or regulatory bases for investigating and proceeding against government lawyers for the advice they gave to government officials? Under what circumstances is it appropriate to initiate any such investigation, and what is the threshold for pursuing legal or disciplinary action? What are the systemic ramifications of prosecuting or pursuing professional discipline against government lawyers for advice they rendered? What effect will it have on the willingness of attorneys in this role to offer advice in the future, as well as the quality and candor of that advice? We have two knowledgeable and distinguished legal scholars with us today to explore these issues. Our first speaker is Brad Wendell, professor of law at Cornell University, where he specializes in legal ethics and professional responsibility. He is the author of a forthcoming book, Lawyers and Fidelity to Law, a student textbook on professional responsibility. He is also editor of another textbook on legal ethics, and he has published several articles and research papers on our topic today. He received a bachelor's degree from Rice University, a JD from Duke Law School, and an LLM and JSD from Columbia. Before entering law teaching, Professor Wendell served as a law clerk to Judge Andrew Kleinfeld of the Ninth Circuit and was a litigator at a large Seattle law firm. Also with us this afternoon is Miguel Estrada, who needs little introduction to this group. Mr. Estrada is a partner in the Washington office of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, where he is co-chair of the firm's appellate practice and constitutional law practice group. From 1992 to 1997, Mr. Estrada served as an assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States. He previously served as Assistant U.S. Attorney and Deputy Chief of the Appellate Section in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. He also practiced corporate law in New York at Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz. He has a bachelor's degree from Columbia University and a JD from Harvard Law School. He served as a law clerk to Judge Amelia Kersey of the Second Circuit and as a law clerk to Justice Anthony Kennedy of the United States Supreme Court. Professor Wendell will lead us off. And for my next trick, um, I, I do Pratt Falls at these things, you didn't know. Um, thank you, Judge Sykes, and, and thank you to the Federal Society for inviting me to talk about this subject, and uh, thank you all for, for coming to our session. Um, Judge Sykes talked about legal, regulatory, disciplinary proceedings, and I will talk a little bit about that, but I wanted to approach this subject from a somewhat more theoretical direction because it's kind of what I do. Um, and also, I think in the Q&A, some of the more regulatory and disciplinary questions will come out. Um, but what I wanted to really focus on is something that we talked about in our conference call among the panelists, and I think you'll hear from uh, Miguel Estrada in his talk, um, the concern about the politicization of the disciplinary process in, in whatever form it takes, whether it's state bar discipline or prosecutions or any kind of regulatory action, uh, the concern is that there will be some kind of um, political battle that is waged over these, uh, over these issues, and the result will be a chilling effect on the willingness of lawyers to enter into government service and on the advice they will provide when they are inside 
government. And, and I agree, this would be a bad thing, and this is something that we all have an interest in, in uh, preventing. But I think the response is not to withhold discipline in appropriate circumstances for lawyers who violate their professional responsibilities, but rather to try hard to find a non-political evaluative basis from which we can evaluate lawyers acting in an advisory capacity. And, and to do that, I think we have to go back to some old school concepts and some old fashioned things that may be out of, uh, out of style now, but things that I believe in. Ideas like the rule of law, um, legal neutrality and impartiality, and objectivity. And so my pitch in this talk is going to be that legal ethics for lawyers in an advisory capacity can build on these apolitical, hopefully neutral, objective notions uh, related to the rule of law. Now, in the legal ethics world, there's some talk about the distinction between government lawyers and private side lawyers, with the idea being that government lawyers may have a higher obligation of fidelity to law. I, I'm not going to rely on that. I think just for the sake of discussion, I will talk as though there's no important distinction between the roles of government and private lawyers, although I think if there is any distinction, the most plausible one would be in the direction of a heightened obligation for government lawyers, and I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A if you'd like. I, I think, on the other hand, that the really important distinction, which has gotten less play than it probably should in the legal ethics literature is contextual with the context being dependent upon how much adversarial procedural checking there is on the interpretation of law that is offered by lawyers. So what I mean by this is that litigators may be free to offer a more creative or aggressive interpretation of law as compared with lawyers acting in a, in a counseling, advising, or transactional planning capacity. Um, we have an inscription on our moot courtroom at Cornell from Roscoe Pound that says the law must be stable, yet it should not stand still. And I, and I think that's right. And, and I think the system as a whole has to have these dual properties of stability and the capacity for change and development. And the important thing, however, is that the responsibility for doing both of these things may be distributed out among different kinds of lawyers with different legal roles, different lawyering roles, having different kinds of obligations depending on the context. And there are, there are certain lawyering roles, unlike litigators, where the capacity of the law for stability is of paramount importance. And I think the paradigm here is compliance counseling, but it also includes transactional, whoa, transactional planning. Uh, and things like that. And there's not a lot in the state bar disciplinary rules about lawyers acting in that context beyond Rule 2.1, which says that lawyers, uh, a lawyer shall exercise independent professional judgment and render candid advice. So in order to get some more purchase in this area, in order to understand this in some more depth, it may be necessary to refer to private law analogs and try to use those cases to derive some ethical principles about the role of lawyers acting in an advisory or transactional planning capacity. Um, and I think the way to do this is to look at litigation and enforcement actions against private side lawyers offering legal advice and then try to use those contexts to derive a set of ethical principles regulating the conduct of, of all lawyers, including government lawyers. Something I've written about uh, is that a common feature of a lot of the ethics fiascos that we've experienced where lawyers have been involved is something that I call the unholy alliance between critical legal studies and public choice theory. Um, this is like a little understood but interesting phenomenon um, going on in legal ethics, going on in the way lawyers think about their duties. And, and what I mean by this is that you can boil down the attitude of a lot of lawyers toward their responsibilities into the principle that Lawyers ought to pursue the interests of their clients, not, not their clients' legal entitlements, um, the interests of their clients um, as long as they are lawful. But the important thing is that the term lawful here is understood with a kind of implicit notion of legal indeterminacy, that the boundaries of the law are quite flexible, quite malleable, and that creative and talented lawyers can actually do a lot of playing around with the boundaries of the law, such that there turns out not to be very much standing in the way of client interests. And these two things together, the focus on client interests and the malleability of the law, the implicit assumption about legal determinacy, stands behind a lot of the cases that we've seen recently, things like the marketing of fraudulent tax shelters, which resulted in the criminal prosecution of several major law firm partners, um, some of the transactions in violation of the securities laws that were at the heart of the Enron collapse, and also that we've seen recently in the Seventh Circuit REFCO litigation, um, and then some older classic cases that people in the professional responsibility field know well from the savings and loan crisis of the 80s, some of the Lincoln savings cases, where there were regulatory enforcement actions pursued against lawyers who provided advice to banks and other regulated financial institutions.